Good afternoon and welcome. Uh, it's Friday, July 17th, and this is Music Cities Together Live, a weekly interview program uh, hosted by uh, Music Cities Together. Music Cities Together is a partnership between the Music Policy Forum and Sound Music Cities. We're thrilled that you're spending some of your Friday with us. We have a uh, really fantastic program today, and we can't wait to get into the conversations. Uh, before we begin, as always, we want to send our huge thanks out to Georgetown University for letting us um, partnering with us in terms of the Zoom platform. Our remarkable producer, Alex Dolvin, who is keeping things working uh, behind the scenes. And again, all of the panelists and attendees that make this program uh, what it is. Um, for those of you who have not had a chance to join us before, uh, we're gonna have conversations uh, on a variety of topics related to what's happening in the music community. Uh, today's gonna be particularly interesting because the first half of our program, we're gonna be talking with one of the pilot cities uh, that's part of our Reopen Every Venue Safely or REVS project and talk about some really fascinating research that they've been able to do looking at audiences and, and, and their feelings and attitudes towards when they are ready to come back uh, to participate in live music. And then we're gonna um, really open up into a, a really interesting, uh, very broad conversation that is certainly relevant in terms of what's happening with the shutdown during the pandemic, but also touches on much broader issues related to the structures of the music industry, how we think about the evolution of culture, how that fits into kind of the broader musical context, uh, and, and the role of education and research in that entire dynamic. So it's gonna be a, a fun kind of mix of conversations today. Before we jump into our first guests, uh, as always, uh, if you have questions, comments, suggestions, ideas, constructive feedback, uh, you can always uh, hit us up at musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. Again, musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. Uh, we uh, will take questions throughout the hour using the very handy Q&A window at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So if you have specific questions you'd like us to try to get to, just pop them in there. And um, with that, I think we're ready to rock. So um, one of the difficulties of everything, but one of the difficulties of this moment as it relates to the reopening of live music is, is obviously not only uh, that, again, here in mid-July, we're in a very uncertain trajectory in terms of what is happening with the virus and with the future and what the science is going to tell us. Uh, the other thing that's very hard uh, for everybody to sort of factor in is something we've talked about every week on this program for the last month. We're going to see one more wave of stimulus funding coming out of Congress, and that is likely to be decided probably late in the night of August 8th. And uh, again, very rarely in the music community, do we have a very pure binary sort of if-then scenario? And uh, unfortunately, the shutdown compounds the sort of economic vulnerability of the entire sector. And so we know with some clarity that if there is significant funding coming out of that trillion dollar legislation that can go to support venues, support the art, support our, our art ecosystem and infrastructure, that's gonna create one set of possibilities as we think about an extended shutdown and transitioning to getting back to work as soon as we can, as safely as we can. If there's no money in that package or that package for some reason doesn't actually happen, it's gonna be an entirely different set of circumstances. And so for today's conversation, we're not gonna dwell on that. Um, we are going to maintain our cautious optimism that our policymakers are going to do the right thing in terms of applying resources and some of that trillion dollars towards the music scene and towards music, music ecosystem. As always, we hold up the extraordinary uh, advocacy efforts of our friends at the National Independent Venue Association and others that are helping make the case for why that funding is so necessary. But again, right now, we don't know. And we're not gonna know for a couple of weeks. And again, once we get into mid-August, we're gonna have a much clearer sense, both of the science in terms of the, the trajectory of the virus and the financial situation. So that's all um, I just want to say at the beginning, because that is all sort of underlying everything that we're talking about this hour. And it's very hard to be dealing with hypotheticals in an environment so fluid as this is. But that said, today is today and it's July 17th and we've got a great conversation. So I'm going to bring in Rick Thurman as, to start things off. Uh, Greg McCaw and Christine Canales from City of Charlotte. Welcome team. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, thank you for having us. Of course, of it's course. Cool. Rick, you were with us in one of our first Music City Together, City Together Live programs, but for the audience members who didn't, weren't part of that or didn't have a chance to, to join that day, could you start with just some big, big, big picture framing and, and also uh, introduce uh, the rest of, you, of, of today's guests you know, from your team 
in terms of what should we know about the Charlotte music scene? What should we know about the work that the community has undertaken in the last couple of years? And you know, how does that sort of influence how you got to the point you all are at today? Sure. So uh, introduction wise, um, <clears throat> we have uh, Christine Canales and she is the director of research at Charlotte Center City Partners, which is where I work. Um, and we are a nonprofit uh, that does economic and community and cultural development for um, Charlotte Center City area. And then we have Greg McCraw, who is a, a partner in one of our, I think our largest independent venue, the Neighborhood Theater. Um, <clears throat> he also um, promotes and book shows all over town and has been doing this work um, probably longer than he cares to admit. Um, <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> um, and so just just broadly speaking, the, the, we, we launched an initiative called Music Everywhere, CLT, and we launched that, um, gosh, maybe two, two and a half years ago at this point. Um, the Charlotte music scene and ecosystem, I would say, especially as I've learned a lot about those around the country, is it, it's sort of a, um, it, it's, it's rich, it's diverse, it's, there's a lot of talent, there's some, some great spots. It is not necessarily as well known as it could be around the country. And there's also, we're, we're lacking, I would say, a lot of the um, sort of music scene ecosystem infrastructure that exists in, in cities um, that are known perhaps better as music cities. So um, so that's what the initiative is. It's this, um, <clears throat> it's long-term, it's a civic initiative, it's economic development, and it's focused on the music scene and the economy. So it's about building that infrastructure that a great scene can then flourish on top of. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we, we always, and, and every week in this program, we like to talk about what was this year going to be? You know, like, I mean, we all, you know, all of us who are doing this work and are part of this program, you know, we're all in triage mode and, and responding to a crisis, but we have all done this work for a long time because we have things we've been trying to build and things we've, we've you know, wanted to, to put into motion. And could you all speak or any of you speak a little bit about to what 2020 is supposed to be like, just so we have a sense of where you're moving in terms of the regional initiative and, and what that was going to look like in practicality? Yeah, from the, yeah, so from the perspective of the, of the initiative, you know, so, you know, I kind of view the work as sort of in its infancy adolescent period. And we had worked with Sound Music Cities on a strategy, which we had um, released um, publicly almost exactly a year ago. And so we were focused on beginning to implement that. And so it was, I would say, kind of two components, internal and external. So internally, we were working on, you know, how do we take this from an initiative to an entity that has a staff person that has more funding, fundraising, et cetera, so that something can organize this work for the long haul. Externally, you know, a lot of it was focused on um, bringing people together. You know, it was um, networking. It was sort of happy hours. It was just because we saw that as we brought people together to develop the work, so for town halls or focus groups, magic happened afterwards. That's when we started to see collaborations happen, uh, you know, people meet each other, you know, understanding, oh, I'm not in this alone. So we were trying to, to, to cause more of that to happen. So more of the community could be involved in the work, but also, you know, straight up initiatives like uh, workforce to, or uh, sort of professional development based on what the research told us was needed. Um, <clears throat> you know, more opportunities for musicians to play around town um, at different size venues or, or non-traditional spaces. Um, connecting the music economy with the corporate economy, some of that kind of stuff. Um, so in some ways, this situation has maybe created some opportunities to do some things that we needed to do. In other ways, we've had to completely put that aside and, and focus on some sort of immediate like needs. Well, it's been awesome to have Charlotte as one of our 11 revs pilot cities um, for m many reasons. It's, it's certainly been exciting to see cities that have emerging sort of collaborative infrastructure be able to then swing into action and try to activate networks around trying to figure out what to do with this whole question of how can we reopen and what does that look like. Um, bringing Christine and, and Greg in uh, on the research side. So at a point it became clear that you wanted to have a, a bit of a data-driven sense of what Charlotte area audiences were feeling and how they were thinking about what it would look like to come back to live music. So 
Can you speak a little bit about, you know, kind of big picture? Why did you decide to do a study or do some outreach and, and how did you, know, you kind of kick that off and design that? Go for it, Greg. Want me to take that? Yeah. So I, I have to say Rick and, and Charlotte Center City Partners were instrumental and in, in the number that, that Rick insinuated earlier. I've been doing this 24 years. So it's a, it's a long time. And the one thing that, that Rick really helped bring together was all of the venue owners and operators getting together and talking. That's something that hasn't happened in, in the 24 years I've been doing this. Uh, and it took a crisis. I mean, it's a bit like Neva, but it, it took a crisis. But, but we were all able to sit down together and talk about what needs to be done. The good thing in our meeting yesterday, it, it, it even went beyond COVID, looking at things that, that we can do as a group together in the future once we get through this. But when we met the first time, it was clear, I think everyone on the call wanted to, re we all want to reopen, but we want to reopen safely. And so that's what drove this, this survey, this collection of data from all of our fans. And you'll see when we start looking at the data, every venue, that, and so not every venue in Charlotte has participated as actively as I guess we'd like, but almost 50% have. And everyone has been been wonderful about putting putting the SEVA information, SEVA is the Charlotte Independent Venue Association. No, wait, we don't call it an association. <laughs> Affiliation, I forget what we call it now. But <laughs> we've, we've changed the name from the very beginning. But everyone's been, been wonderful about getting this data out, sharing the survey on their socials, sending it out to their email list. And I think that's how we were we were successful getting such a high response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was also a good, to me, it was a good first act for this new SIVA. It was a way to say like, hey, we're doing this together and our first act is reaching out to you, to our customers, to our audience. And it was, we felt like it was important to show others like, hey, this isn't just a thing. Like they're working together on on something that involves public outreach, which I felt was a it's a good statement to make about that their their the alliance is true, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Alliance. That's <laughs> that's a word I couldn't find. <laughs> yeah, but also <laughs> the city. I mean we discussed this. This is information that we want to to share with the city so that everyone understands again, we want to reopen just like everyone else, but we want to do it safely. Well, I think that's Greg. I appreciate you saying that because I think there there are two. There's one, you know, kind of long term structural point, you know, and and I'm I'm sort of right with you in terms of how long I've been doing this work. And and a challenge in the music community historically is that a lot of decisions get made by feel. You know, it's like I feel like musicians are touring a lot, or I feel like people are selling a lot of merch, or I feel like Spotify is not paying out, or and it's always important when you can actually put data behind it to actually get a quantitative sense of what is the actual reality on the ground. And, and when you're able to get 2,800 audience members in one you know, music market the size of Charlotte, that's at scale. I mean, that is a, a, a very healthy sample size to start to get some real sense, tangible sense of what that looks like. And, and that extends then to, in the revs context, in the reopening context, again, you know, we can anticipate what we think most audience members might feel like but, and, and let's, let's go ahead and go into your data. Alex is going to share his screen and, and look at some of these slides. It's fascinating to see that you're able to drill down and basically look at either ages or look at, at people who like to go to different types of venues and really let them drive the conversation in terms of what they want to see and, and what that's going to mean as tools, not only for, you know, kind of city leaders like Christine and Rick in terms of big picture, you know, leadership, but also on a venue side, what are the kind of things that you need to look, look and see, you know, sort of it from a, from a venue management and outreach standpoint. So let's run through these. Do uh, you want to give the audience the good news that you have 55 slides or should we just let this uh, go through all 55? <laughs> sure. And they will all be available for anyone who wants to see them. If you want to discuss them, I'm happy to have a further discussion. I, we were joking before we started. My background is in science, so I'm the perfect person to be a venue operator. Um, yeah, but, there there are multiple PhDs on this panel right now, and, and I am not one of them. Let's put it that way. 
So I'm not going to go through every slide. I, I, even I couldn't sit through a statistics lecture this long, but, I, but I, I do want to touch on some of them. So if you want to switch to the next side, slide, it's just a synopsis. Um, so we collected this data, I think this is important, between June 8th and June 17th. So that was really before any place in the country started to reopen and we started to see the issues with reopening that we're seeing in certain states, certain cities. So we're aware of that. We've discussed, we don't want to over survey, but we've discussed doing another survey at some point when at least North Carolina and Charlotte when, when the situation's a bit clearer. We still don't know when we can reopen even at limited capacity right now. So I mentioned before, there are 23 venues that we identified, 11 of those participated. Um, and th everyone sent out emails to their mailing list and put these on their socials. So we were able to collect data from 2,744 people, uh, which, is, which is a large data set. Mm -hmm. If you wanna keep flipping through, just, just the age breakdown. Um, interestingly, so th this is, these are reflective of the questions we asked. Um, we had very few respondents over or under 20, which is not surprising. Our drinking age was 21 in North Carolina. I guess it is everywhere. Um, so, so there probably weren't that many people on our mailing list that were younger. Surprisingly, our largest respondent group was over 56. Uh, and you can see it's pretty equal breakdown uh, between 26 up to 55 after that. You can keep going, keep moving. This question we asked, and, and I left it in just because I think there's, there's one funny thing. We asked we ask everyone if they were music fans or if they were local musicians or if they were both. And, and I always laugh at the 21 people who were local musicians who are apparently not music fans because they didn't put both. Um, we really and didn't. All the venue owners were like, oh, we know exactly who those 21 people are. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, we, anyway, yeah, we, we didn't do much data analysis on this. But next slide, you can see this is, this is really Charlotte specific, so we won't dwell on it. But these are the, the venues that we identified as live music venues. And we were able to capture, by, at least by estimate, how many shows people who responded to this attended at each venue. And then if you go to the next slide, actually how many of the respondents went to at least a single show at every venue. So you can see there are a handful of venues that, that really um, probably contributed the most to this survey, which is living in Charlotte, not overly surprising, but the Visualite, Neighborhood Theater, Evening Muse, Amos's, Petra's, um, several of these where we, we got a lot of the information. And then the next one, again, this is, this is really only relevant to Charlotte, but just to let all the venues know, the people who did attend shows at their venues, how many they actually attended in the course of the year. So you can see a similar breakdown, but some of the venues where people are very loyal customers. Then next slide. And this is all the raw data just based on all the respondents. This is probably the question that if I had to do this all over again, I'd ask a different way. Mm -hmm. We probably had too many categories and we had, uh, we had an open-ended portion of this question. And so I went back through and reinterpreted some of that open-ended data. Uh, but we asked people when they'd be willing to attend a concert again. And remember, this was in early June. So primarily, the answer was immediately. I, I highly doubt that that would be the answer today. But, but you can see that, that people are very eager to get back out. And then we had a series of you know, weeks, months afterwards, but, and then not until 2021, which, was, which had a pretty large response. And then the things that we were able to pull out, a lot of people said it really depends on the data. We didn't offer that as an answer. If we go back and do it again, I think we'll, we'll change and ask some of these things. And, and a lot of people said not until there's a vaccine. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, you, you just get an idea that people are really eager to come back out. You, you can move on. Um, then, then we ask a series of questions about how we should handle reopening, what people expect to see. 
um, how do you feel about temperature scanning of patrons? And there were four choices. So uh, primarily people, people answered that either it should be required or they would really like to see it. This question, again, if I had to redo the survey, I'd limit this to three answers, not, not four, because we, we got a lot of doesn't matter. And then we got about 13% of people who said it's a total waste of time. And you'll see that eight to probably 12, 13% come up a lot as we go through this. And, and those are the people that, that just, uh, my impression at least is just don't care. They wanna come out. They don't care what we do. They throw caution to the wind. And we see that, that number, like I said, right around 10% going through most of these questions. The next one, should patrons be required to wear masks? So again, 12.7% of the people say it's not necessary, but the remainder of the people say either it should be required or it should be encouraged. It's not an option in North Carolina now. We have a mask requirement in North Carolina. So if music venues could open, we would need to require that all patrons wear masks. Yeah, and when we, when we sent the survey out, that mandate had not passed yet. So it was a topic of hot debate at that point in time. Yeah, and it was even internally. People were, some of the venue owners were concerned about how to enforce it. And, and honestly, if you read our newspapers, people are still concerned about how to enforce it. But, mm -hmm. So then the next question, should staff be required to wear masks? That was overwhelming. So patrons, um, you know, there were far fewer people saying that it should be required, but for our staff, there was an overwhelming response that it should be required. And again, our 10% of the people who just, that nah, doesn't matter. Next question, should venues enforce social distancing? And there was a lot that we could get also out of some of the open-ended questions, but this encouraged more than enforced, and there was a there was concern even among our patrons about how would how we would be able to enforce this, which is which is something we as venue operators all share as well. Okay, next one. Um, should we have touchless bathroom fixtures? Most of the venues that are more rock club like don't have those now. I think that's probably true across the country. Again, the, the predominant answer was encouraged. Um, less, only about 20% of the people said it should be required. This is an investment for most of us. So that's something that we want to know. And I think for the most part, as venue owners, we're going to do it anyway. We feel like it's the right thing to do. Uh, and again, our 13, 14% of the people who say it doesn't matter. Next one, should touchless payments, yeah, touchless payment options, that's even more skewed towards encouraged or we don't care. I think a lot of people are used to going out different places and, and not every payment option that they use right now is touchless. Next one, and this was probably one of the most interesting questions to me and I think to us as a group, and that is, would you share your contact information when you check in a venue for track and trace purposes? And I expected a lot of opposition. And you can see overwhelmingly people said, they would gladly do it. Mm -hmm. uh, some people said they would, they wouldn't really like it. But even, even now, our people who are sort of our, we don't care, only 6% of people said that they would absolutely refuse and walk away. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then if you want to go quickly, and I, let's not look at all of these, but responses as a function of age. Again, we're able to, to break this data down uh, this is probably too busy because of all of the answers. So yeah, yep. go to, to Tim, it, it's, you can stop at any one of these. But the point is, we are able to break down these responses by the age of the respondents. We're also able to break down on particular venues to see if there's a difference in how people who might go to a punk rock club in Charlotte versus uh, more of a, an older sit down Americana type, type of room respond. Um, and surprisingly, I wouldn't put any, I wouldn't put much weight at all in the under 20s, just because we have so few data points there. Uh, but what's interesting is, in, in a lot of these responses, when we get to the people who are 
41 to 45, 45 to 50, even 51 to 55, they are, they seem to be less concerned. And I, I can't, you know, we have a big data set and I, I don't know that I'm enough of a statistician to talk about statistical significance, but you can see a, a change to being a little more cavalier once you hit about your 40, late 40s than with some of the younger people, which again was surprising to me. Mm -hmm. So in these graphs, average is always out to the far right. Hey, Greg, I'm not sure how we are on time, but I want to make sure that Christine can offer some of that text analysis insight. Yeah, and I, I've only got, I, I think, one more that I want to talk about. And if, if you go down a little bit, so go to the next slide that looks like this. One of the other things that I've gone back and done, keep going, keep going, stop here, uh, no, go back one. So I looked at correlation of these answers. So if a person answers this question in one way, do they answer the other questions in a similar way? So in a, if, if there's perfect correlation, someone who answers A in one case answers A in another. And if there's no correlation, meaning there's, you know, someone who answers A could answer all of the other answers a different way, that number's zero. So you can see this is a correlation between temperature scanning of patrons and all of the other questions that we ask. So you can see these are not insignificant. We have other ans other questions like the the uh, the mass questions where there's much higher correlation. Uh, and then you can go through one more slide and then I'm done. If you go to the next slide, so you can actually see. So in this case, it's it's the correlation between temperature scanning and masks for staff. And you can see on the x-axis, if people answer the temperature scanning, it should be required how many of them answered the same way for masks for staff. So you can start to get even, even higher level data, I guess, um, about these people and how they're responding and, and, and whether, whether they correlate. If they answer, if they're really conservative in one case, are they always conservative? So point is, there's an awful lot of data in our survey. Um, a lot of it's unnecessary here, but I'm willing, I'm willing to share it with anyone who wants to take a look. Yeah, Greg, that, that's awesome. And again, Alex, put, put a link into the, uh, the chat for those of you who want to download it and, and do a deeper dive. And we can certainly be available for some follow-up. I know, Christine, you did some text analysis, right? Did you go and look at some of the open-ended responses and try to bring some findings from that? What, what would you like to share about that? That's so interesting. Okay. Yeah, so I did the, the text analysis for the open-ended question that they had for the CIVA survey. Can I share my screen? Um, Let me try that. Okay, yeah, I can do it. Okay. Do you see this all right? Yep. Okay, cool. Very cool. Um, so let me do this here. Okay. So I worked on the open-ended question um, responses for the CIVA survey. And the method that I used for that is called um, topic modeling. Let me do this. Topic modeling. And with topic modeling, um, each... Uh, each person's response, so it could be a paragraph, it could be a sentence, it could be a word. So that is considered a unit. And for each unit, and here in this particular data set, we have 1,278 text responses. So that's 1,278 uh, 1, units that um, I used for modeling um, the types of conversations that people have in this data set. So here... Just, um, just, it, it, just uh, uh, as a uh, uh, as an ex uh, a description of the method that I use. So, topic modeling is is part of machine learning um, exercises, and the way to do it is you basically, as the analyst, you get to choose um, arbitrarily the number of topics that you want to to um, that you want your model to analyze for you using the units that you have. So here, I just arbitrarily choose, chose 10. And then from there, I, I usually work from 10 and see if, if there's a lot of overlap, then I decrease it to five. And, and if there's 
not enough information from 10, I go from 10 to 15 to 20 and so on. But for this, for this particular data set, I started with 10 and it seemed, it seemed um, appropriate. Um, okay, you, um, if you have questions at any point, feel free to, um, to raise them and um, we'll get through that. And Christine, we're going to okay. have to, to bang through this pretty quickly. Okay, um, yeah. Apologies. Okay. Yeah. So we have 10 topics here. And as you can see, each circle here is a node and that is a topic. And each line that connects each node is, um, it shows you whether topics are correlated with each other. So if, if people are talking about topic one, um, are they more likely to talk about topic two as well? So that is the point of having um, these connections. Okay, so just as a summary, the, the 10 topics that I found um, from, from the data set is that first, there's definitely excitement to see live music again. And people um, in that topic, in, in that particular topic, they really didn't, um, they, really don't, they really didn't care about whether they're, they're precautionary measures or not. So it's just, let's just see music again. For the second topic, it's call for precautionary measures to avoid um, COVID spread. The third is hope that venues will reopen soon. Fourth topic is distinction between indoor and outdoor venues. So people are, are more lax in terms of precautionary measures when it's outdoor versus indoor. Fifth is opinions on social distancing and wearing masks specifically. Number six is reopen only if there are clear gu guidelines for the venues. Seventh is appreciation and gratitude for showing care through the survey. Eighth is expression of support for independent venues in Charlotte. Ninth is suggestions for staff and venues when they do, re when they do reopen. And number 10 um, is general information sharing about COVID. But just to summarize it, like all those 10 topics, these are what they're talking about. Patrons are excited to see live music again, but then there, should, there are calls for precautionary measures, specifically for social distancing and wearing masks. And distinctions are made for venues held in indoor venues and outdoor venues. And if you're interested to know how the topic uh, modeling um, went about, so this is one, th this is how it, uh, it, it, it usually happens, okay? So for topic nine, it's about suggestions for staff and venues when they do reopen. So you can see this one here, this yellow um, node here, that is topic nine. And you can see which topic it relates to. So it doesn't relate to all of the, the other topics. And here, this one here, that's on the right side of it, um, that is the word cloud. So these are the words that are most used when people are talking about topic nine. This one here, the one on the right, the bottom right, it shows you the representative documents and you can see your topic probability. So these are ordered in terms of which, um, which representative documents have the highest percentage of appearing in this topic nine, in topic nine. And you can see here, this is an actual, this is an actual data point um, in the data set. So this one, the, the top, um, the, the most likely um, unit in the data set to appear in topic nine says that suggest, suggestion to set up beer stations in different places around the venue to disperse crowds and hand sanitizer stations set up in several places. So there's a lot of that that you can, um, that you can definitely, um, that we can definitely check out if you're interested. That's amazing. So Christine, I'm gonna have to, to jump in here. Um, Okay. Greg and, and Christine, congratulations to both of you and your teams for doing this work. This is so amazing and it, it deserves a much deeper conversation than we're able to, to give it on this particular program. Um, you know, the ability to, you know, kind of use those networks to activate your networks, to put together the methodology, to ask the questions, and then to create the snapshot of time, which I would just flag, I think is super fascinating that you are capturing this data right at that post Memorial Day. Um, sort of window when it felt like we had one stage, one sort of trajectory for the pandemic that maybe it would be fascinating, you know, Greg, I know you said potentially going back in the field at a certain point when maybe it's a, a different understanding or sense of what what is happening in terms of, of getting back to normal. Um, but it's so helpful and so useful. And, and thanks to all of y'all for, um, for joining us and sharing that data. Again, um, the slides are in the chat, and if you have follow-up questions, you can chase me, chase Rick, um, and we're happy to talk about how you could deploy similar data in your community or just what the findings are, how they can inform everybody's work moving forward. So 
apologies for cutting it short, but um, we have a lot to cover today. And, and I just really appreciate the Charlotte team coming in and spending time with us. So thank you, Rick and, and Christine and Greg. Great stuff. And I'm going to bring in Anna Chalenta now. Anna, are you with us still? Yep. There she is. And Anna, um, again, is our partner at Georgetown University and our dear friend and co-collaborator and, and Quende Confense from the City of Ottawa and Music Policy Forum Board and Josh Kuhn from USC and all things that Josh Kuhn does and Josh Kuhn Extended Universe. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit because it's been amazing to talk sort of like granular data, like what are we seeing from audiences? What's the sort of sense on the ground related to the pandemic? Let's broaden this way back out. And all three of you have been thinking and writing and speaking and in different sets of collaborations with your peers and with others about real broad issues about where are we even now, you know, sort of beyond the pandemic, where should we be, where could we be? And I'm going to, Anna, actually turn over to you a little bit to kind of frame the conversation. But what does it mean, you know, if we're going to have a, a whole restart of the music economy, what should that look like? What are the things we should be thinking about? And what is it, you know, wh where should we be taking this conversation, not just about reopening what we had before, but about what we could and should have, it, have in the future? Well, um, thanks. Thanks for um, letting us have this conversation. I would say uh, one of the things that really, there are two like, of the little quotes that I've heard in the last few months that really struck me. One was, history has found us. Like, this is an historic moment. Um, we should be aware of that. You know, this is going to be one of those times it's written about. And um, Scott Cohen of Warner the other day uh, made the comment that um, COVID-19 is the Napster moment for live music. And I think there's something to be said there. I, you know, we talk about going back to normal. Um, and, you know, I wonder what that is. What fascinates me is kind of all of these... Um, new approaches to connecting over like we're doing right now with Zoom uh, with musicians and live music and audiences and, and sort of building new networks and new sort of worlds. And so, um, you know, and this is something that I know that Quinde has thought about a lot and that Josh has thought a lot about. So I'm wondering, Josh, I'll start with you. Um, you've been thinking about some of these issues for quite a long time. Like how does music symbolize kind of who we are. You have that great, um, and I, I'll let you give it, but instead of thinking of us as a melting pot, you have uh, uh, another musical metaphor that I think is really helpful to think about. So I will just turn it over to you. Sure, thank you. Uh, really great to be here with everyone. Um, yeah, the, the, the metaphor you're referring to um, is the crossfader, um, the horizontal toggle on the bottom of the DJ mixer, standard DJ mixer that I've tried to use in my thinking about how to connect um, different inputs and find points of common connection to build new mixes. Um, but mixes, in this case, can be new publics, new communities, um, new ways of understanding the world. Uh, and so instead of a melting pot model, where all, uh, all of this difference and diversity um, allegedly uh, comes, it, that it all comes together, but in a melting pot model, um, it all actually melts together into singularity, into, um, in history of the U.S. at least, a singular American race. Um, and so for me, the melting pot has never been a useful model. I've always thought of it um, uh, far more of a lie, uh, in fact, and the way people would use it. Uh, and so for me, the crossfader uh, and the crossfade is, is a, a perhaps a more equitable, um, uh, maybe more radical uh, vision of, uh, of what society can actually be where difference and different inputs are juggled and sustained in the mix instead of faded out and completely erased. Um, but th these issues around publics and spaces that, 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 that keep coming up, I just think are so important, you know, um, and I, I was looking a lot uh, actually uh, uh, at, you know, the work of Quende, who I think in the, in the piece that I read at least, I think you, you summed it up, that the, the stakes of this so beautifully and so well about the beauties, uh, on, on the one hand, of the kinds of possibilities that that re kind of remote participation and, and digitally distance uh, models of coming together can actually provide and be really democratic and really powerful. Um, but on the other hand, um, there is that longing uh, for the thing that we all know, which is that the physical spaces um, and the physical places 
be it just outdoors when we all come together or even in those physical spaces, the long history of the role of nightclubs in various kinds of social liberation movements. Um, anyway, yeah. I just was really taken by, by, by the way you frame that. Thanks, man. No, I mean, um, and I think, you know, a big part of the way I think about it, too, um, uh, and it's it's sort of uh, the way that space can embed a range of different kinds of values into a moment. And so it's like, it's also that, um, uh, it's not just that, you know, there are these new possibilities that are, that, uh, that have emerged as a result of sort of uh, digital interconnectivity, but it's also thinking about sort of, um, uh, how, uh, I guess the idea that, these possibilities are possible only for, are still only possible only for a few. And, you know, and the fact that, you know, when we think about the way that space forms a low, and, uh, sort of like the lowest common denominator of the way that we have sort of done society as a species over the entirety of being a species, it's really hardwired into the way that we, uh, or, or there's, a, there's a facet of it that's hardwired into the way that we do society democratically as well. And, you know, the way that we're able to, uh, the way that uh, sort of the old forms of space or, or the old forms of uh, coming together, I should say, utilizing space as a tool for doing that, how much more democratic that actually is than some of these digital forms of connectivity, which are totally, you know, it's totally, it has a totally different effect walking into a room than jumping into a Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these, uh, and, and in terms of the way uh, that you're able to access other people and the conversations that you're able to have uh, and the access that you're able to have to the group uh, is, is different. And so I, what will be interesting to me is sort of to see the way that um, I guess as more of the way that we connect becomes digitized, how sort of different uh, sort of power hierarchies and metrics of understanding the way that power is deliberated through uh, convening, how that will map onto these, onto these, uh, onto these, uh, into this new form of socialization. You know what I'm saying? It's like, will we see, will it, will it actually just be reflective of existing power structures? Uh, as a result of you know there being this sort of this uh, this level of um, uh, of of uh, I, w I don't want to call it exclusivity, but um, but uh, you know this, but just the idea that digital space is inherently less democratic than physical space in many ways, it, and maybe that's a controversial statement to make. I don't know. Well, no, but, I mean, we see it for those who are participating right now, you know, the host can control, you know, muting someone or not, and, and, and who gets to see which images. And, you know, they're, they're, what is interesting is as effective as it can be to run a meeting, the, the, you know, you can't just voice you, your opinion without the person just going, you know, I'm tired of hearing from you. I will mute you now. So there is a real power structure. And you see it teaching. You see it in music venues, it's very, you know, this is a different type of music venue in that way, which is odd. So, yeah. Yeah, and I've been doing a bunch of streaming as well, and it has been a real challenge to sort of, uh, sort of take, or to, to sort of take all of the, uh, uh, all of the uh, intangibles of what a party is and, uh, and communicate that via stream. Well, you're not communicating that via stream. Ultimately, you have to give that up sort of yeah. give up you know, all of the, all of the, 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 uh, the kinds of um, sort of uh, externalities that come with, with the, pl the pleasurable externalities that come with doing something in live space. And, you know, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be something that we're going to have to think about in, in, just in terms of your comment, the Napster moment for live music. So much of the live music experience is actually all of those externalities. Mm -hmm. And without those things, how do we actually think about live music going forward? Yeah, yeah and, 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 you know, we're talking about bodies coming together, right? And so the, the kind of stakes and responsibilities of a group of strangers um, rubbing elbows, right, and sweating on each other or, you know, existing next to each other um, in anonymity, in the dark, and creating new social formations without even knowing it, that, that is a much different conversation than the kinds of community that can be born um, on a Zoom webinar. Yeah, and, and, and you're reifying the social contract when you do that. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's a big part of what 
going out at night together is about. It's about sort of like everybody being in a slightly unfamiliar situation and sort of, uh, and confirming the social contract with each other. I think there's also something about when you go to a space there, I mean, I'll talk to my students and things like that. And, and I myself, you know, they, they might patronize, like they might go to a venue because they just, that space is a safe space. It feels good. They like to be there and it doesn't really matter who's performing. Uh, that's very different from if you decide to watch a live music thing, you know, a webcast online because you're going, oh, I want to hear this. So there's even been a shift of what draws us into a live music performance sometime. And if I could, could jump in real quick, I mean, I, I think that, you know, the, the notion of a social contract is so interesting because I think for a lot of audience members, when they are experiencing an artist where they're participating with their art or they're feeling, you know, the benefits of, 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 of the art, you know, I think the implied social contract from the consumer standpoint is that that artist is being, being taken care of, that they're being compensated, that they are, you know, able to, you know, sort of benefit from this exchange from between music fan and musician. And, you know, part of the irony that at the same time in the United States, we've had the global shutdown of the music economy or the live music economy at the same time that we've had this amazing awareness and sort of re-engagement around our broader social and economic and, and political structures and systems is bringing a lot of things to the fore at once. And I know Quende in Canada, there's a lot of, um, there's been a lot of intentional work for throughout the history of the Canadian music industry to think about the structural failings and inadequacies and challenges of sort of having corporate control you know, structures that have been attempted to be addressed through policy, through nonprofits, through other sectors. I know, Josh, you've been, you know, kind of thinking about some ways in the United States that we may want to start some other strategies to sort of, you know, uh, identify where there have been some failings and some things that we can and should be doing, or the industry can and should be doing to try to address those. So maybe, you know, Quinda, you could speak a little bit about to some of the Canadian models that you know, maybe are unique to Canada, or certainly we don't see the United States. And then Josh, maybe a little bit about some of the thinking that you're doing about how can we, we can do better and, and, and really challenge um, the status quo. Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll try and do sort of the history of the Canadian music industry. Uh, you don't have to do the history of the Canadian music industry, but I mean, just- but, uh, No, I'm joking, uh, I was joking. Um, what I'll- Give five slides. I'll speak about I'll speak about one particular organization that's had a strong impact on the Canadian music industry as a funder of the industry, and it's called Factor, um, and that stands for Foundation for Assisting Canadian Talent on Recordings. And you know, Factor exists uh, mainly because of the U because of you guys, because of the U.S. in many in for, for the most part, because you know the U.S. is a twenty six uh, uh, what is it trillion dollar economy. And Canada is, you know, about a $1.8 trillion economy. And we are next door. And so as a result of that, you know, there's a huge, you know, there's a huge influence of, your, in, of American media networks, American corporate networks, et cetera, um, you know, that influence, you know, Canadian, the, the basically Canadian content producers. So as a result, we have something called uh, the CRTC, which is a, which is very similar to your, um, I can't remember, the FCC, I guess. Um, and it regulates, you know, uh, broadcasters in Canada and regulates how much Canadian content they, are, they have to play and sort of how much foreign content uh, gets played on the radio. And effectively in the 80s, there was a partnership that got formed between the broadcasters and the federal government, because the broadcasters recognized that they did not have enough Canadian content to play because there wasn't enough that was um, that was uh, uh, that was sort of uh, uh, radio ready. Because as soon as something would become radio ready, it would get picked up by an American company, and they would go to the states, and then we would be back in the same boat. And so, in order to develop the industry here, the radio broadcasters created a small fund. At that point, I think it was $150,000, and started building it uh, over time to actually fund the creation of more Canadian content. And over time, they developed this fund to a point where the federal government decided that they should get involved with it through our Department of Canadian Heritage. So we actually have a federal department that deals with culture and heritage, and it's through that department that uh, funds now flow to this not-for-profit organization, which is a foundation called Factor. The organization now manages uh, upwards of $50 million 
and it all is uh, there to fund the independent Canadian music industry. So it, it's there to sort of protect against the incursion of um, sort of U.S. corporate or global corporate interests, I guess, but, you know, mainly, not mainly U.S., but you guys are the biggest player. And so, but these, these major corporate interests in the sort of content creation ecosystem of Canada. And, um, and yeah, it's been a very successful model uh, for music, and it's a unique model. Um, but, yeah, as I said, it's been successful since about 1982. And I guess to your point about sort of social justice issues, I'll just close by saying Factor is not a social justice organization. It is an organization that is about building uh, successful music companies and successful music careers. Uh, however, as a result of the fact that there is federal money that's associated with it, that federal money comes with strings because there are values that the federal government has and when it spends money, we have to spend it in accordance with some of those values. And so it means that we do have to address issues of diversity and inclusion. We do have to address, uh, you know, indigenous marginalization. We do have to address uh, anti-black violence and some of these things as those things become policies of the federal government. Awesome. So just like the U.S., right, Josh? Uh, yeah. Um. So my, my, my entry point into, the, into this part of the conversation, I suppose, um, these are things I've been teaching about for a long, long time and, and um, working with my students at USC um, on these issues, but came to a head uh, over, over the past, past month or so um, in conversations with, with all the mobilizations uh, and protests and work being done across the United States, especially when I started seeing major labels um, Performing, in my opinion, performing their outrage um, and channeling some of that 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 outrage into significant donations, which is great, um, but wanting to see a larger um, movement toward actually restructuring the way that money is flowing um, in the industry. Particularly, I'm interested in royalties um, and the, the historical inequality and historical injustice built into recording contracts that have disproportionately affected uh, black artists um, who historically themselves and now their, their families uh, and estates um, do not get the money that they're owed. Uh, and so I started talking about musical reparations uh, and immediately started talking about that and finding out that lots of other people are talking about that. And so I've, I've joined up uh, with folks um, at the Black Music Action Coalition, BMAC, uh, and the Breathe with, me, Breathe with Me organization to start actually doing the research uh, to kind of, the, 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 there's a series of phases. So there's going to be academic research and scholarship about the history of royalty inequality in the United States. I'm putting together a team of scholars to, to kind of pull some of that key and basic information together. Um, and then with the help of BMAC and Breathe with Me, uh, who are working with a large scale coalition of managers and artists and folks in, in, inside the industry and outside, um, to actually uh, create demands and uh, work through a series of action steps. Uh, and so one of the things I'm trying to develop and think about is what would a new digital platform or digital ecosystem, that in my mind I'm calling the big payback, um, what would that look like to allow consumers to actually take action and pay directly um, uh, into the funds of artists who have been victimized by bad contracts. Um, I, and so I, I'm thinking about it in terms of consumers because I simply don't, don't trust and have no reason to historically to trust major labels to do that. Um, there's also frankly too much money at stake. Um, that said, if major labels are ready to do this restructuring around royalties, fantastic. Um, but um, so we're trying to do that research, we're trying to figure it out. Um, and, and it's really brought me back to you know, as a historian, it's brought me back to rethinking the very notion of the recorded music industry globally and trying to understand that if we're looking at the, the, the birth of recordings in Europe, for example, you're talking about, you know, German recordings in and of African colonies. Um, in the history of the United States, the first black recording artist comes from a family of former slaves. The U.S. recording industry is built on the uh, infrastructure of racial capitalism, 
uh, and white supremacy. Uh, it was built on the profit, um, the kind of profit margins of the blackface minstrelsy industry. Um, and I think we, you know, those of us who know this and study this history, this is something, this is not new information. Um, but it, I think, is, is um, old information that can be used in a new way at this very important moment. We have a, a great question in from uh, Josh, our mutual friend, Rebecca Gates. Rebecca asks, if we can use this moment to break the pattern of musicians working to support um, right-wing corporations and inequity via playing conservative-owned conservative venues and events, uh, and, and can that parallel thinking around labels or recorded music. So is this an opportunity to look at some of these other structures? I think she's, um, not to put words in Rebecca's mouth, but what comes to mind is um, Anschutz family and, and their involvement in Coachella and that sort of whole, uh, you know, festival circuit. Yes, um, I, I agree with that and, and would hope so. And I would also extend that to kind of brand partnerships. Um, similar to some of the things we heard in the earlier part of the conversation um, you know, in this meeting, um, is that because of the way the, that the industry has been restructured over the past 20 years or so, um, artists have had to look to, for alternative ways of making a living. Because if they're not getting paid through, um, through sales or through streams or uh, through publishing, um, then there's been, as we all know, that move toward um, the musical brand model um, and the, you know, the centrality of syncs and all these things, which means that I think it's become way more of a, of a new normal for artists to, to um, kind of casually um, enter into partnerships with companies that uh, maybe politically they don't see eye to eye with. Um, and I, I know just from anecdotally speaking to so many different kinds of artists who've had to make all kinds of decisions in their head about is this a good deal? Is this a bad deal? Just on moral grounds, um, the Coachella, you know, breaking the Coachella uh, stranglehold is a is a very good question and a very difficult one to answer. Yeah, no easy answers there, but it's certainly an important question. And, and I'd just like to ask one last thing for for the three of you. Oh, I, um, I think Quinde had one, wanted to add on that one. Oh, I'm sorry, Quinde. Go ahead. Apologies. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was just going to say that um, you know some of like the question around. Uh, sort of, you know, not not just some of the interests that were that were sort of identified there, but I guess in Canada, some of these larger corporate interests, uh, which sometimes are synonymous with, uh, you know, the, the the group being sort of intimated at here, um, you know, those there's a there was a, a a federal program that just got rolled out through Factor for supporting the live music industry, and it was exclusionary of sort of these types of corporate interests. So they're not actually able to apply for this money, for this sort of bailout money. It's exclusive to uh, Canadian owned companies that operate in the live music space. Uh, and so like, you know, um, it's challenging because some of these, I guess, you know, these are American corporations ultimately. Some of, some of like, yeah, Live, live Nation is an American corporation and so is AEG, correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah and so, you know, I, I guess you couldn't use the same kind of uh, screening mechanism, but the, the idea of some kind of uh, differentiation between the independent side of the industry versus this other side of the industry uh, and sort of the, in, in terms of the way you think about resourcing uh, will be important because they're so in, in, in the U.S. especially, they're so enmeshed. Well, I've got just, we're, we're short on time, but I, I want to just take this in one last direction briefly, which is, you know, I think we can all safely in this conversation, you know, sort of um, agree that, you know, Anne is my generation have probably not done the best job taking care of the music community. And it's been a, a difficult transition from an analog to a digital industry. But I think most music activists would sort of recognize and value the importance of the generational transition and make sure that you know, the analog generation is making way for new people with new vision and new relationship to technology and community and how music is made and shared and accessed. And a lot of that is happening at the university level and people like our producer, Alex and, and Josh, the students that you work with and the students you work with, when the people that you interact with all the time, especially in a moment of the loss of, of again, physical interaction, the uncertainty with what's happening on campuses, what if anything can and should we be thinking about over the next year or so about how we're making sure this isn't a moment where we're just, again, we're talking earlier about networks that we're not just sort of 
you know, re-strengthening, you know, the, the sort of existing networks that maybe have not, leadership networks that maybe have not got the job done, but we're really thinking about what does it mean to authentically transfer leadership to those emerging generations? Yeah, so I'll, I'll jump in real quick. I would say the one thing that uh, has come up just by having conversations with students as they're going through this is, you know, when we talk about music and when we talk about um, kind of what it means and what it symbolizes and all those sorts of things, I think a lot of students who really did a lot of live music, went to concerts a lot, um, got an instant gratification out of that but maybe didn't think too deeply about why they were choosing what they wanted to go or who they wanted to listen to or what the music meant or what the lyrics were. I think this time of being at home um, had a lot of people go to music that they loved live and really listen to it on a deeper level and there, be, there was a deeper understanding of what that music symbolizes, what it means. Um, and so I th if, if one is going to see a silver lining in this, I think if we think of human flourishing, you know, how, how music sort of helps folks, we've gone from the gratification like eating a piece of cake and, wow, that was delicious, but it didn't, wasn't really good for me, to um, having deeper thoughts and conversations about what the music means, maybe a little bit more nutritious in that way. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, one thing that I'm thinking about or I, and that I'm going to be writing about next it has to do with networks and the ways in which uh, this period of time uh, has or the effect that this period of time has had on the networks that we connect to and uh, whether those whether it means that we've increasingly connected to sort of like globalized networks or that we've actually dug into our localized networks more understanding the relationship between those two scales of network and sort of how to, uh, you know, in as healthy a way as possible, disintermediate them. Uh, so that there is some, there is almost sort of like a, uh, you know, that, that there's a, 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 yeah, a clear point of differentiation between sort of those, that local and global network and that uh, we sort of, it might be an opportunity to shift uh, the, the power relationship between them. And I think that, you know, that'll, uh, that's something that, yeah, we should be thinking about how to take advantage of uh, right now. I, I, I would add maybe it's just that in the work that I do with, with my undergraduate students in particular who, um, you know, want to go into the music industry in one form or another, and, and they're, they're, they're first, here in Los Angeles at least, they're, you know, their first idea is, oh, I want to go work in Golden Voice or Live Nation, and that's just because it's right there in front of them, and it seems like, oh, they put on the, the shows I go to, and they, they work with the artists that I love, and that kind of thing. But once we then talk through that, um, the, the more critically minded of them, or the ones who have also studied um, various bodies of work around critical literature, around uh, identity and society and economics and culture and race, um, is they realize that, that there's another way. Um, and so what I've increasingly started to see, I'd say, which are two different paths. One is that um, they want to go into uh, a company um, that's well-established, um, like Apple Music or Spotify, but go into those companies with a critical mindset and with the desire to say, well, I'm actually armed with this history of what the music industry is, and I'm armed with the history of how race works and how gender works and sexual harassment works in all these industries, and, and I'm not going to stand by and let that happen, and I want to rise to the top and become that next leader. And then the other path is, I don't, it, it's a student saying, I don't want to go to those, those big companies, and I'm going to start my own shop, and I'm going to come together with my friends, and we're going to do grassroots style, and especially at this moment when there are no rules, um, that I, I'm seeing so many students saying, we're going to create our own businesses based on a totally different model of networking, of friendship, uh, and of values. And I think that over the next five years, we're going to see some really exciting new music and culture models um, that might not threaten, you know, the kind of very large companies, but are certainly going to create um, alternative models. I think that's a great way to, to end it. It's going to be an amazing uh, next couple of years. You know, what's the cliche about interesting times? So, um, but thank you, as always, Anna and Quende and Josh, thank you so much for joining us. And, and of course, Rick, Christine, and Greg uh, from Charlotte for presenting earlier. Alex, our producer at Georgetown University for hosting us. Um, all of our friends and, and board members and team members from Music City together. And of course, 
uh, all of you who have spent uh, a bunch of your Friday with us. Um, as always, this program will be put on our YouTube archive over the weekend. If you thought this was interesting and want to share it with your friends and networks, please feel free to do so. Questions, comments, concerns, ideas, uh, all that great stuff, send it to musicpolicyforum at gmail.com. And I uh, hope everybody has a safe and productive week. We'll see you next Friday. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.